Okay, we are good to go. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kirsten Joseph. I am collaborating with Untamed Science to bring you guys interesting topics in biology and ecology. And today we're actually going to go ahead and dip our toes into a bit of geography research as well. So I hope you're excited. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to do research in the remote stretches of the Canadian Arctic? Well, I definitely have. And today we're going to find out. As part of an educational project I've been working on on biomes worldwide, link down in the description, I wrote an informational page on the Arctic tundra and I thought it would be really good and really useful to talk to somebody who's doing real science in this biome to get a closer look at what it's like and talk about the importance of the region. So with me here today is master's student in the Department of Geography at the University of Calgary and my good friend as well, Zoe Walker. So she is currently working on understanding carbon-based greenhouse gas emissions from Arctic lakes. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, we're gonna break it down little by little. So Zoe, just to start off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and before we dive into the science? Um, yeah, for sure. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm currently a second year master's student at the University of Calgary. I did my undergrad degrees here. I have a Bachelor of Science in Natural Science, which is just a split between two concentrations. So I did biology and geology, which is where I met Kirsten. Um, I also then started taking geography courses and loved them. So I declared a second degree in geography and then just extended my student status and <laughs> decided to pursue a master's. I do love to read. I collect house plants and I also have a rock and mineral collection. Also a huge Lord of the Rings nerd in every way imaginable. I've been to Hobbiton twice, and if I'm allowed to travel again ever, I would love to return for another Lord of the Rings themed vacation. I also have a six month old kitten named Moose. Excellent. <laughs> kitten named Moose, very Canadian of you. <laughs> yeah, he's adorable. Um, if you guys wanna see, Zoe's Instagram is actually down in the link, mostly if you wanna chat with her, but there's beautiful cat pictures as well. So go ahead and check that out. All right, so thank you for that, Zoe. And just to kind of get us started, what would be your elevator pitch of your research? Uh, what it is that you're doing in short? Right, so I study the accumulation and eventual emission of these carbon-based greenhouse gases, so methane and carbon dioxide, which you've probably heard of. Um, so if you picture a lake in the winter, there's a thick layer of ice that acts as a cap. So these gases are able to accumulate in kind of unknown quantities. That's part of what I'm trying to determine. And then in the spring, when that ice melts, there's kind of a spring pulse of these gases to the atmosphere. And most carbon budgets recognize that lakes are contributing carbon during the open water season, but haven't incorporated this spring pulse. So I'm trying to fill the gap by taking under ice measurements during the late winter, early spring period, um, so that I can estimate what kind of fluxes to the atmosphere we're looking at. Right, okay. So we're trying to take a look at that initial burst, which probably could be a lot more of an impact than even over the whole summer in theory, right? Yeah, some mm -hmm. studies uh, of people who have done under ice um, estimates and measurements have found that up to 27% of CO2 emissions can occur like for the whole year budget, 27% of that can happen just during breakup. So if that right. is not being included, you're really missing a huge chunk of it, so. Okay, so all these gases are trapped there and you get this big release rate right at the spring. Am I, am I wrong sort of comparing this to shaking up a pop bottle a little bit and popping off the, oh, Absolutely, the, if we're the cap, talking yeah. these gases, I've referred to my own project as lake farts and burps because that's basically what it is. Okay, excellent. Awesome. So thanks for breaking that down for us. So we're looking at the flux of these gases, especially at spring. Why, why is your research important? Which I know is kind of a, a tough question. Don't worry, if you've written any kind of scholarship, you got to shamelessly plug yourself. So <laughs> um, most carbon budgets, as I said, they recognize lakes as important, but they don't include this under ice component, which is really important. Um, additionally, 70 5% of lakes exist uh, between the 45th and 75th lines of latitude. And most of those are in the Arctic region. And logistically, it's harder to sample in the Arctic. 
So if these lakes aren't being included in carbon budgets, it just throws off the whole thing and it doesn't necessarily make it useless, but it makes it less effective. So if we're able to accurately understand the whole carbon budget, it makes things like modeling a lot easier and more accurate. So. Right. Okay. So we're missing, we're kind of neglecting this huge region, the Arctic tundra biome that contains most of what we should be looking at realistically. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And especially with the tundra and permafrost holding methane that's being released. Methane is a way more potent greenhouse gas. So if you have unknown amounts of a super potent gas entering the atmosphere, you know, we have no idea what kind of impact that's having. Right. Okay. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Um, so we are interested in the science, but what I want to talk to you a little bit more today is about the experience and what it's like being out in the field. So can you just describe your field sites to me a little bit? what the landscape is like, what animals and plant life you kind of see while you're up there. Totally, yeah. So I conduct my research in Cambridge Bay or Ekelet Stutiak in Inuktitan. Um, and so that's on the island, uh, Victoria Island in Nunavut. Um, there's a small community there, about 1,700 permanent residents. And then there's a government research facility up there as well that we're able to stay in, um, which makes this field work like quite bougie in comparison. Um, I have friends who study glaciers and you know they have to pack everything they need, hike up, live on the glacier and then pack that out versus we have you know the luxury of a heated building and running water. And you know, some field work doesn't allow for that. So that's really nice. Right, okay. Um, I was also fortunate enough to, I've been to Cambridge Bay once and I'm hoping to go again in 2021. Um, but the first thing I noticed when I landed in 2019 was something was missing and I realized it was the first time I'd ever been above the tree line. So if you've ever landed somewhere with no trees, it's a very strange feeling. It's just in the spring when I went there, there's like a blanket of snow that covers the landscape. And if you're outside of the town, every direction looks the same. Um, our field guide likes to play a game called what direction is home. And despite being a geographer, I'm very directionally impaired. <laughs> and this is really important because, you know, you could think you're heading back to town and you're, you know, snowmobiling out into the open ocean. And so safety is a huge concern when we're planning these field seasons, just because there's a lot of elements that you need to account for. So we all carry our own GPS units. We all drive our own snowmobiles. We carry an inReach device, which uh, basically is a satellite communication with the research station. So they know exactly where we are all the time. Uh, they know when we'll be home. And if you know something happens, like someone gets hurt or a snowmobile breaks down, we can push the help button and they'll, they'll send the troops to come fetch us. Right, okay. <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah, we also, have to have a ton of certificates to go up. So I have my ATV license, my snowmobile license, wilderness first aid, I have my firearms license. You know, we, we carry a rifle because if we're out on the sea ice, um, polar bears are a threat to us. And while us Southerners might think of that as kind of a harsh reality, um, hunting up North is a part of daily life and everyone in the community is part of it in some way or another. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> But in terms of uh, animals, when I was up there, luckily there were no polar bear encounters or grizzly bears, because we're at that kind of weird intersection where polar bears and grizzly bears um, can both exist. So you will get a pizzly bear or a growler bear, depending on who the father is. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, we also saw, I saw a herd of muskox, which was really cool. Um, we were snowmobiling by and they obviously perceived us as a threat and formed a circle so clearly they had young which was really cool to see like in person yeah um tons of arctic fox if you call them an arctic fox in front of a local they'll laugh at you because they're just foxes up there <laughs> um i didn't see any wolves but they're also present and uh migratory birds because i was there in the spring we had a ton of geese and ducks coming up mm -hmm. so that was uh, unexpected because the I've never been at the end of a migration. So to see like hundreds of them just like gather, that was really cool. 
Right, right. Yeah, a lot of people do perceive it as kind of like a cold wasteland, but there is quite oh, a bit yeah. of life there. And especially the the bird migrations are really phenomenal. And a lot of tourism in, in the Arctic is definitely geared towards the bird watching and that kind of stuff. So that's great that you had that experience. The mus muskox especially are really <laughs> incredible animals and definitely something that I would love to see at some point. They're right. super, super well adapted. Uh, there's a little bit about that in the article in the link if you guys want to take a look at more on how these animals are adapted to survive in these types of habitats because it's a super harsh environment and it's pretty difficult. That's yeah. excellent. Um, were you often by yourself then if you you had all these safety measures and the, the worry about having to hit the button if your sled broke down or something? Uh, no, so we never go out alone. We always hire a local guide um, because they're A, more familiar with the landscape mm -hmm. um, and B, are just better adapted to, you know, MacGyvering things because in Cambridge Bay you know you can't there's two grocery stores like there's not you know a, like a Walmart or like a giant superstore where you can just go pick up things you know if you need something you have to order it and the wait time is a lot longer and we have to bring everything with us mm -hmm. so having someone who can you know MacGyver something really easily is super critical for the work we do. Right right okay and, and somebody who's just sorry somebody who's just more familiar with everything about being in the Arctic at all times. Totally. And mm -hmm. like, I have my firearms license. Do I feel comfortable shooting a gun? No, like right. <laughs> he hunts a moose every year, you know? So mm -hmm. he, not my kitten, an actual ungulate moose, but oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So having someone who just knows like what they're doing is really comforting. Right. <laughs> Additionally, yeah. we usually, um, so while I study lakes, most of my lab group does oceanography related things, which is why we're out on the sea ice and um, on the land. So rather than each of us flying up individually to individually do our work, uh, we'll have, you know, a longer stretch of time, but maybe we'll do two lake days in a row and then we'll go out and do two sea ice days and then have a day off and then, you know, kind of gauge it by the weather and what needs to be done because um, the wind affects a lot of what we do. So if it's like super windy and gusty, we don't really want to go out. Um, but if we're doing something like a lake close to home, then it's usually okay. Right. Okay. So you go and you help each other with your field work. Totally. And it's super mm -hmm. helpful because, you know, if like when I was up, the people I was with, they had a field season under their belt. So they could be like, okay, you know, this is where we store stuff and this is how we do this. So I had kind of like a guide rather than just arriving in the field being like, okay, what do I do? And right. so this year, I'll be that person to be like, okay, like here's the knowledge that I've acquired from the people that were here previously, so. Right, and sometimes like just the little things, not even just the science, but things about preparedness and different ways to organize your day. Yeah. Totally, totally. Right. <laughs> awesome that's awesome so that's a little bit about um the environment and what it was like what is it like doing research in the arctic and what is more what was a typical field day for you a little bit more of the specific sampling and that kind of stuff Ooh, that's a good question um for me a lot there's a lot of prep that goes into it so again with like the safety I need to know what field sites I'm going to the night before so that I can send my safety form to be like these are the lakes I'm going to be at so if I go missing you know I'm at one of these places or somewhere in between right um so first things first is figuring out where you're going um second is prepping all of your sample bottles labels um, we have to poison our samples our water samples with mercuric chloride it kills all of the living things in the water because we're looking at the dissolved gases. So if you kill everything that can photosynthesize and consume carbon, you get an actual snapshot of the gases there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, transporting mercuric chloride, it, it's a it's a dangerous chemical. So, you know, making sure that's prepped and stored properly. Right. Um, and then the morning of getting your snowmobile started, you know, if it's cold out, maybe it doesn't start on the first try, you have to get fuel oil um we tow a sled box with us so we have to fill that with all the stuff we need for the day mm -hmm. and then once you get to a field site um which can be anywhere from five to 40 kilometers away um we'll use our auger to drill through the ice so the lake ice is on average about two meters thick which um 
sounds really cool and really awesome, but gets really old after you've drilled <laughs> a bunch of holes in it. Right. <laughs> there was one year I wasn't part of this field season, but the, um, the like automatic power auger, like wasn't working. So they had to hand crank it Oof. meters of, and lake ice is way thicker and like harder than sea ice. I was just like, oh man, I would have canceled that field day. <laughs> right. Um, and then for my, my lakes are mostly shallow. They're not that deep. So I use a submersible pump instead of uh, what you'll use in an ocean setting. So if you're sampling from like 80 meters down, um, you'll put in a Niskin bottle. So it's basically, if you picture a cylinder that's open, my hands are the flaps, they're open yeah. on both sides. Okay. Um, it'll slide to the bottom. And then once you lower it to the depth you want, you'll send a messenger, which is a weight that hits um, the top of the first one and it mm -hmm. some feat of engineering snaps the two ends closed so you have captured water at that depth and then you can bring it up and collect your water samples right um, but with a submersible pump I just pump it down or I put it down to the depth I want and then I pump the water up and I collect samples for um, dissolved inorganic carbon um, which includes all the carbon species in the water and then I extract co2 from that in the lab later um, methane, I also collect sort of um, supplementary data like nutrient samples for nitrates and phosphates because that can influence the carbon species, mm -hmm. uh, dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, salinity, things like that. Okay. All right. So mostly preparedness. That's, that's preparedness. The <laughs> oh my God. You're, if you do any kind of field work preparedness, like be over prepared, you know, bring six extra pairs of gloves just in case. Cause one time I ran out and I had to raid a first aid kit. Like you don't think about things like that until right. you're like, Oh, okay. Or, you know, it's so cold that your line freezes. What do you do? Like, okay, everyone bust out your hand warmers, like hold on to the line so that we can get the water flowing again. <laughs> Right. Okay. So there's a lot of creativity involved as well, perhaps. Oh <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a few photos that sure. I uh, took out of a file that you gave me and we'll talk a little bit about all those different pictures. So anybody who's watching can get some visuals. We'll try to give a little bit of a description just in case anybody here is um, just listening. Totally. So... Here we go. Okay. So give me one moment here. So this one, I went ahead and pulled out of your proposal. Now, I think this is an Argo, right? What, what is this? Was this uh, often transport for you guys? So unfortunately, not for 2019 when I was there. Okay. Um, this is part of a, a greater research project. So this we have the unit now. <laughs> okay. Um, going to be equipped with sensors so that we can immediately get feedback for the CO2 and methane concentrations. Mm. Um, that's part of, I think, a postdoc's current project right now. Okay. Um, but the main idea behind this mode of transport over snowmobiles is with the snowmobiles, um, they get stuck kind of in the spring end of the season if we're towing um, the sleds because they're heavy. And when you get that kind of slushy, sticky snow, right. it, it gets dangerous. So the idea with this is if we can load this up and it has like the better traction with the mm -hmm. um, treads, it's just safer and easier. And it's also heated. So doing winter sampling is a lot easier. Right. I'm up in the spring where the temperatures range from, I think my coldest day was minus 20 all the way up to, you know, above zero. Okay. But in the winter, like last week in Cambridge Bay, it was minus 52. Right. So heat uh, becomes very essential to not even just like being comfortable doing field work, but being able to do it at all. Right, right. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, these things are pretty crazy. So um, if anybody was considering pros of going into geography, you get to drive some pretty awesome all-terrain vehicles. I definitely would say that is one. All right. So I have here a setup of what looks like a field day. Sorry yep. about that. I just have to get this. I like how up. you have it labeled big setup because that's exactly <laughs> But it is, <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the big setup. So is this your sampling on a lake or is this an ocean sample? So this is lake sampling. Okay. Um, but we do have some oceanography stuff going on, oddly enough. Okay. Um, so if you look at the, I want to point, but I know like my fingers aren't going to cover it. Um, the, okay. the lady in the purplish 
burgundy jacket. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this setup here. So this is where we've drilled a 10 inch diameter hole with the auger. Okay. And then we're lowering Niskin or not Niskin bottles in this. We're lowering a CTD. So CTD stands for conductivity temperature depth. And what it does is it's a sensor that you drop through the water column and it mm -hmm. gives you a profile of those measurements. Oh, okay. So um, it can provide a lot of information about what's going on in the water column, if the lake has like been stratified. So if there's like a layer um, of like warmer water at the top and colder water at the bottom, you can right. have thermal clines or um, they're called different clines, but like a picnocline is the change in salinity. <laughs> um, no, that's pressure. How, okay. I'm getting confused. That's okay. <laughs> about what's going on in the water column. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, that sled box is our kind of portable science like lab. Right. Um, so we have the, all those kind of cords coming out of uh, there. Yeah. So that's our submersible pump line. Okay. And so that's going down into the lake through a two inch auger hole. So our submersible pump is narrow enough that we don't need to use the 10 inch auger, mm -hmm. which is really nice because the 10 inch auger is just a lot more work. You, you need two people to do it safely um, versus the two inch auger. It's just kind of like a really, really big power drill <laughs> that you drill down. Right. Um, and then I don't know if you can see it, but inside I would be collecting the water samples um, inside there yeah okay all right interesting yeah so this is kind of the the the, the real deal the big deal here yeah that's that the big have. <laughs> all right um i think this is you being very happy taking water samples if yes. i'm correct <laughs> yeah yeah so here um i was reading measurements off of our ysi um multi-parameter probe. So this is a probe that gives us live feedback um, for different components of the water. So dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH, salinity, things like that. And dissolved oxygen is really interesting to me because methane um, is produced in environments where there's an absence of oxygen, so anoxic conditions. Right. And so if we have really low dissolved oxygen, I get excited because that likely means I'm going to have higher methane, but I won't know that until I get my methane results back. Right. Okay. So it's kind of nice to be like, oh, this is probably like a gassy lake. <laughs> <laughs> the one time it's good to have a lot of gas, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. So there's that one. Um, oh, I wanted to, I think this one is just a little bit of a closer look at um, drilling holes in the ice. Um, yeah. So this, <laughs> this was one of those MacGyver things. Okay. Um, so a former undergrad student was doing an honors thesis and she was looking at how DIC varied with different currents. Okay. So there is a, at the bottom of this two by four is a tilt meter, which measures the current in the ocean. So if it's at the bottom, it'll move more or less based on what the water's doing. Okay. Um, so to put it in there, we, you know, drilled our 10 inch auger. Uh, hole and then lowered it and then it froze and there was supposed to be a like a like heated cord that wrapped around so that we'd be able to get it out easier I don't know if anyone believed that that would actually work so <laughs> I this is my very first day of sampling and I had no idea what was going on and so I just saw everyone starting drilling like a million holes around this two by four in the ice and I was like what is happening here um, but we were trying to get it so we could wiggle the two by four out without mm -hmm. losing the tilt because these instruments are quite expensive. Right. So we auger down like just before the ice because we didn't want to hit the watt like the cord that was holding the tilt meter in place. Okay. So that's what this is, but right. this never is a dull a moment. Example of like, okay, how do you measure this and like figure out how to make it work? All right. Well, never a dull moment for sure. That's that's excellent. Okay. Um. So then I just wanted to. Oh, here. Sorry, I didn't mean to pull this up earlier. This is yeah. your study site, right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So um, if anybody's not very familiar with Canada, this is very far north. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's on the 69th parallel. Yeah. Awesome. So that is that is just to give you guys a little bit of an idea of where where we were studying. And then um, we have I just wanted to show that um, a couple really nice pictures here of just the scenery. Um, 
Were you, other than the tree line, were you really surprised with what you saw or did you kind of expect uh, what it would look like? I feel like part of me kind of knew what to expect, but then mm -hmm. I was still surprised. Like in the previous photo, like that's Mount Pelly. It's like the only topography on the landscape. It's actually um, uh, an esker from the last glaciation or when it was glaciated okay um so things like that was really cool so when we were doing lake things I was like okay I have some form of reference for where I am <laughs> so that was really nice right mm -hmm. yeah the definitely the lack of uh, any kind of landform could be stressful <laughs> I would think especially, especially when you're so knowing, used to, like, yeah right so just knowing that I don't know where I am and being like I don't know which way is home <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is that is stressful I could see that um, I also found this picture to be uh, really beautiful. Yes, this was on, this was, a, I took this a few days before I left. So this was sort of um, kind of approaching mid-June where you finally start to see the, the thaw and some of the like plant life come out. So a lot of moss, mm -hmm. a lot of just grasses really. Right, for sure. Yeah, excellent, awesome. I think that's, oh, this is my, uh, I labeled this that science is hard. Can you tell me what's happening in this picture? So <laughs> this was, um, I, so kind of backtrack. So um, in Cambridge Bay, there's one flight a day in and out. And when I was going back, I gave myself a couple days or a couple, one day to be exact, um, between leaving and my convocation of my undergrad degrees and the wind picked up the day I was supposed to leave and my flight was canceled <laughs> oh. and so I had a, like a mild meltdown because I didn't really like consider missing convocation like I didn't connect that you know this stuff is normal that you just miss a flight because oh we can't see can't land we'll just go back to Yellowknife um, so this was me rolling down the hill because I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> right, okay, so unpredictability again as well. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so don't book like important things within a few days of returning from field work because stuff happens and mm -hmm. you know it's better just to give yourself a week buffer than have to cancel something that maybe was really important to you. <laughs> right, I think that is super important advice. Be prepared, leave yourself some time, um, be ready for the unexpected. I think it's a big part of, of field work and anybody who's a biologist watching this or a, a, any any scientist at all is gonna tell you the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, this one is a, a happier photo that we can maybe end on. <laughs> totally, this was, I started doing this pose every time we got to a lake site because I started picking lakes that were farther and farther away from town, which just meant, you know, more time on the snowmobile, more time outside. Like sometimes we were doing 10 hour days outside and like you get like back to the research station and you're just like, I am so cold and tired. And like, now I have to like do labels for tomorrow and like unload all this stuff from today. And right. so um, when we got to a field site or if we got home, that just became the gesture of like, we did it. <laughs> That's awesome. It's good to keep positive. I guess you have to have like a pretty pretty good attitude. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, I think that was the majority of the photos that I pulled out. I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a visual as well. because totally. It's great to hear about it, but a little bit about that. Um, so kind of moving a little bit off of your research and just more about the Arctic tundra itself. Um, why is it so important that we conserve the Arctic tundra for um, you and for everybody? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's not like obviously my area of study, but it's a super unique environment. And as I said before, it's underlain by permafrost. And mm -hmm. once that starts to thaw, you get a release of methane, which is not a good thing. There's also been, you know, some studies that have shown like ancient viruses that are like, oh, like let's party in 2021 now. And that can be concerning because <laughs> right. you know, we've seen what one virus can do. So let's not be introducing things from our past. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, as the planet continues to warm, and in particular, as we see the Arctic warming faster, um, you know, as the permafrost melts, you're going to see major land changes. So this can affect roads, it can affect structures. Like right now, they've, um, the town, like you won't find a basement anywhere. Everything's on stilts to kind of account for the like slight changes. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But if you just have something collapse that can change, you know, how humans travel, how animals migrate, Um, if it turns into a swamp, like, you know, that totally changes things. So um, I would say the biggest reason to conserve it is just because it can't be replaced and the things that are changing are really hard to put put back. (laughs) Right. Okay. It's a super sensitive, it's a super sensitive environment um, as well. The animals that are living there are already just on the edge of their physiological capacity. So any changes there super are super impactful to that. Um, So definitely something that we have to not take for granted. Uh, Excellent. Uh, Something I like to ask people who do research is to share with me your least favorite and your favorite moment you've had while researching. Um, You can choose if you want to do favorite or least favorite first. Just let us know so we're prepared. (laughs) Okay, we'll go with least favorite first. Okay. I just did not like getting there. Um, For me, travel was, you know, maybe you have one checked bag and your carry on and, you know, that's it. Um, going to the Arctic to do field work, you have to bring everything that you could possibly need. Um, so this means all of your personal gear for cold weather, you know, like your big ugly boots and, you know, hiking shoes for when you're just like going around town and stuff. Um, and then, you know, you'll shove in a bunch of random consumables into your bag, like rubber gloves that we go through, syringes, bottles, a snowmobile helmet, like there's all kinds of random stuff you need to bring. So what happens is every person going up has to bring three oversized bags. And if you've ever traveled, I've never traveled with something oversized. I didn't realize how much of an ordeal it was. Right. Um, And you get so many questions. Like I took a Pelican case full of methane bottles and I got like questions like, why do you have this? What are you doing? And I'm like, they're just empty glass bottles. Like I'm going to do like science. I have a note, like, (laughs) trust me here. I have a note from my teacher. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Having this case of things. Um, And then uh, it would be okay if it was just Calgary to Cambridge Bay, but we have to fly to Yellowknife and then we have to overnight and then we fly out to Cambridge Bay the next morning. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you have to collect all of your things in yellow knife so your bags go to some like far away oversized land that you have to figure out where that is and then you have to figure out how to get to your hotel and everyone's right. always like again why do you have like two giant hockey bags and like a pelican <laughs> case and I'm, are you moving <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. so when I got and like when I went I traveled alone <laughs> so it was 10 times worse because I couldn't like I didn't have some else someone else with me to be like oh yeah see we're like two weirdos together with a ton of stuff um and so then you have to get all this stuff into your hotel room and I didn't think to book like a main floor room so I'm trying to shove my little trolley into the elevator and to get it into my room and then they were like please return that when you're done and I was like absolutely not it is living in my room until I leave tomorrow morning <laughs> right And then getting that all. And then, you know, when you land in Cambridge Bay, I was picked up by one of like someone else who's already there from our lab group. And so they, you know, arrive by snowmobile with like a sled to throw the stuff in. And then you have to like open up your bag in the middle of the airport and put on snow pants because now it's minus 20 and you came from Calgary where it was like 15 degrees. And you're like, what is happening? Right. Okay. Okay. Just getting there is just, it is an ordeal. (laughs) Right. And I think especially probably your first time, I think maybe the next time you'll be a little bit more mentally prepared for it. Well, now, yeah, exactly. Now I know what's happening and like little things. um, There's another town, uh, Kubalukta, that apparently is like common for the plane to just stop there and like pick some people up and go. And so we landed and I was like, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. Like, oh, right. Things like that where you're just not expecting it. Right. So. Maybe, a little, maybe a little bit more of a guidebook. Well, hopefully anybody that's watching this that's thinking about doing research, maybe I'll have a little bit more uh, mental preparedness for all the unexpected and the difficult travel and that kind of thing. Excellent. Well, yes, that sounds quite awful. And let's end on a positive note, I guess, for your favorite part, favorite well, moment. Um, favorite part, I mean, other than just like being there and getting to like having the opportunity to do it. I mean, it's easy to complain when you have a bad day or something doesn't work, but um, I mean, I love what I do and being able to do it is really awesome, but um, I will share my one funny story. Um, There's a couple, but this one is probably, it's like the best and the worst. 
Um, okay. so, <laughs> during the 2019 field season, I technically wasn't a graduate student yet. I was like a research assistant because um, my supervisor wanted me to come to the field and see what I could do and kind of how things worked. So we like obviously knew each other because he later accepted me as his grad student. Um, but the field guide, so that's just the backstory because that'll become important later. Um, I overheard our field guide complaining about something um, on the sled and he said tabernacle. And so I knew we were using some Inuit words for like certain things. So I was still trying to get down with the lingo. So I was like, oh, tabernacle must mean sled. Okay. All right, lock that down. Um, I'd never heard that word before. So it made sense to me. So the next day <laughs> we're getting sorry, ready. Sorry. <laughs> we're getting ready to go into the field and I walk up to my supervisor and I'm like, oh yeah, like which tabernacle are we taking? And he looks at me like, what did you just say to me? And I was like, you know, like, I'm just like playing it cool. Like, yeah, I know the lingo, like tabernacle, like which one? And he was like, what? And I was like, are we, which sled are we taking? Like the covered one or the uncovered one? And he was like, do you mean the comatic? So I'm like, comatic. Comatic means sled. Quick Google uh, later, I found out tabernacle is a very vulgar French word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So anybody that wasn't aware is it's definitely, I think maybe French Canadian. Um, yes. Mostly. Yes. Yeah. So it is, it is a swear. So that was a, that must have been a good icebreaker for you guys <laughs> it was just and then of course everyone knew about it after and like just died like oh it's so embarrassing so I'm like hi like tabernacle <laughs> that'll definitely happen uh yeah <laughs> no, don't worry I think once I mixed up the word for lawyer and avocado in Spanish when I was saying I wanted breakfast so you can imagine how that went down as well so <laughs> totally understandable but I mean good job playing it cool and I'm sure you guys will share that special moment for oh, yeah. brought up from time to time <laughs> Excellent. awesome well thank you so much um the last little thing I want just to wrap us up is if there's anybody watching out here that's hoping to study a master's in geography or maybe biology or something else do you have a piece of advice that you could give to those people that are um kind of thinking about taking that leap into a graduate degree or maybe even thinking about taking their undergrad yet um, what's the advice that you would maybe give to them um first and not so fun but definitely something you need to consider is the financial perspective um right I feel like a lot of people go into grad school thinking it's going to immediately give them a pay raise and that's just not the case most of the time. So if you think getting a master's degree is going to mean you're gonna be making a huge amount of money, no. <laughs> right. um, it's also important to consider how you're funding grad school. So while you are paid as a graduate student, it's not a lot of money um, and you have to pay to go to grad school. So understanding those kinds of trade-offs uh, I right. think is really important just from just like a logistical and like, is this even possible with my life right now situation? Mm -hmm. um, additionally, you wanna make sure you're studying something that you love and that you enjoy. <laughs> right. Because the last thing you wanna do is commit to something that you hate and have to pour yourself into it, you know, 40 hours a week for two years. Um, as much as I'll complain about carbon chemistry and carbon math, which I've currently been struggling with, um, I still love what I do. And I really enjoy, uh, you know, learning more about it. You know, it's, it's a weird feeling because I feel like as an undergrad, when you're like tasked with writing a paper, you're like, oh, okay, like I got to go find this and, you know, figure out that. Like as a grad student, now you're just like, oh my God, like, fast Viking, like my dude, like he's my lake dude. And like, you get way more excited about these things. And okay. I never thought I'd be like that nerd that would just like know papers or be excited when like a new paper comes out. So yeah, make sure you're studying something that you enjoy. And if you're like just starting an undergrad, look into the courses that you're going to be taking. I didn't do that when I first applied to university. I was a business student, technically. Okay. <laughs> like yeah. I applied, saw that I had to take like finance and like, 
oh, just some awful sounding thing. So I deferred a year. I was like, you know what? I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, just like lived and traveled and, you know, did all the stuff you're supposed to do at 18. And then I came back after a year and was like, science, science is what I like, not business. So take the time to look into it. And, you know, even looking afterwards, like what kind of career can I have with this degree? Because while it's great to specialize, if you specialize in something so specific that it limits your job opportunities, that's something else to consider. Right. Okay. So definitely preparedness, look into it, take your time and do something that you enjoy. You know, I think just if I can cut in a little bit, making sure that you're not getting pressured into something specifically by somebody else and, for not, it's not great for everybody, but I took a gap year too. And I found it was really beneficial to uh, my studies as well. Cause I had a little bit of time to sort of figure out what I want to do. But um, mm. if anybody does have any questions, both of us are really open to talk. Uh, there's links in the descriptions for my Twitter, my Instagram, Zoe's Instagram and LinkedIn. So you can go ahead and check that out. Um, thank you so much Zoe for joining us today. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. And thank you so much for everyone watching. Uh, Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. If you want to know more about geography research at the University of Calgary, there is a link to Zoe's lab supervisor, Brent Brent Els, sorry, who is the associate professor at the University of Calgary. And he runs the lab, which focuses on carbon cycling and freshwater marine hydrology in the Arctic. So you can check that out. And until next time, uh, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.